President for the St. Louis Astronomical Society. Appreciate that you're all here. Um, and Varu Gahak, uh, oh, say your last name, Varu, by you. Uh, Gokhale. I am horrible. <laughs> Gokhale, so it's Vayu as in, if you're from Louisiana, you say you're from the Bayou. Bayou, so it's Vayu, okay. Gotcha. Bayou, and like then <laughs> Gokhale is as in go play, but instead of play, you say you change the P to C. Oh, okay, go play, okay. Yep. I got you, that's pretty cool, I like it. All right, so at any rate, He's going to be quantifying and combating light pollution for us. That's why you have the very strange starry, starry night background here that's half lit and half you can actually see. So without further ado, I'm going to, get, I'm going to let Varu take it over. All right. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, Don. Thanks, everyone at the St. Louis Astronomical Society. And thanks uh, to IDM Missouri that's hosting this talk. Uh, like Jim mentioned, um, I have a screen, um, on the screen you can see I have used my awesome uh, skills with, uh, with graphics to um, kind of show what the sky or how the sky is being ruined right now um, uh, in terms of Van Gogh's Starry Starry Night. And yes, of course, you can see on the right side there is the glare or I've tried to simulate the, the sky glow. But also on the top left on the not sky glow side, you can see a bunch of lines, uh, which is just as annoying, if not more, uh, which are these satellite mega constellations that you can see in the sky. Um, so, um, so that's kind of the idea of the screen. Okay, so um, all right, here are some of my contact details. Uh, one of the perks of having a somewhat unconventional first name. My name is unconventional, not just by American standards, but even by Indian standards, it's somewhat unconventional. Till about seven years ago, I was the only person on, on online with that name. Now there are three more people with that name, so it's getting more popular, I suppose. Uh, but you can easily find me if you Google uh, Yujit and then either Astronomy or Truman State, you should be able to find me. Screen advance is kind of getting stuck for some reason. Okay, so here's the outline of my talk. Um, I'll give you some background about light pollution and uh, I'll quickly uh, talk about why it is important to combat it. I wish I had more time to talk about that, but, uh, but there is and I have other things to talk about which fall within my expertise. Uh, but I was just going to point out a few important things about why combating light pollution is important. I'll spend some amount of time talking about how we measure light pollution. And then I'll talk about what we've been doing here at Truman State. And um, then also about what uh, the IDA Missouri SQM program is. And I'll, I'll discuss a few results. But they're very preliminary, as you will see. Uh, I have a couple of slides where I'm haven't quite filled in all the information because I don't have it yet. <laughs> we are working on it. And then I'd like you to think about a few things and I'll, I'll leave you with a couple of messages depending on how much time we have regarding the kinds of things you could, you could start doing and the kinds of things that you could start thinking about if you're interested in combating light pollution. Um, I, I'll make a couple of apologies here. <laughs> One is my slides tend to be a little too, uh, little too uh, texty. Um, and um, I like animation, so you'll see things sliding around. Um, I don't know how it's gonna work in this forum, but it, it works well in my classrooms and uh, when I do in-person colloquium. Um, so with that apology, I'm gonna leave that alone and, and just kind of plow through. Um, I don't expect you to read everything that's on the screen. I'd say better off listening to me, and if you don't understand something, then you can read. Um, so I'm an associate professor at Truman State University uh, up in Kirksville, Missouri. Kirksville prides itself as being the North Star of, uh, of Missouri. I'm trying to uh, use that to uh, influence some change. You're saying uh, from town, it's, 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 it's almost impossible to see the real North Star. <laughs> uh, and so we need to do something about light pollution. Um, I grew up in Bombay, which is kind of the New York City of, of India, I suppose. It's big, polluted, congested. Um, 
polluted in more than one sense. Um, it took us about two hours to get away from the sky glow from Bombay usually. Um, and I grew up, I was born in the 70s, but I grew up really in the 80s where India didn't have television till the mid 80s. That's when they streamed the original series of Star Trek the first time when I was about 10 years old. So that left an imprint on me. And I also saw the Halley's Comet uh, in the mid 90s and that's what got me hooked up to Astron. I came to Baton Rouge in uh, Louisiana. I went to LSU for uh, grad school, which is a really good astronomy and gravitational wave uh, uh, program. So we're not just good at football, we do other good things as well. Um, but Baton Rouge is just as bad as Bombay when it comes to light pollution and humidity and those sorts of things. So that didn't really, I didn't, still didn't quite appreciate the beauty of the night sky. But around 2005, a year or two after I got my first car, um, I started traveling around and went to the Smoky Mountains in, in the fall and for the first time had a really good view of a really dark sky. Uh, the Smoky Mountains are not, you know, in hindsight, Smoky Mountains are not the most darkest skies you can find, but, but for me, it was the darkest at the time. Um, and I saw the Andromeda Galaxy through a small binocular uh, and it filled up the entire field of view, um, which had never happened to me before. Uh, it was just absolutely awesome. After that, I traveled to several national parks and, and, and in Arizona, in Utah, out west on the Colorado Plateau, camped and hiked, uh, especially with the eye of spending nights in, in those skies there and I really got hooked to it. And I moved to Kirksville in 20, about 27, 20, uh, uh, 2007, 2008. And I realized we are a smallish town and yet our skies are kind of terrible. And, and that's what got me going in, in uh, towards studying light pollution and, and doing something about it. I really seriously started working about it maybe four years ago. Um, and then I joined the IDA last year um, and then um, also became uh, a member of the uh, Missouri chapter of the IDA. Uh, so that's kind of my playground, if you will, in terms of uh, combating light pollution. A few pet peeves that I want to highlight as, as misconceptions people have. I want to clarify that right away before I get into the meat of the talk, which is people have this misconception that light pollution is simply about uh, astronomy and stargazing, and obviously that's not true. Um, it concerns a lot more things. In fact, astronomy and stargazing is almost like a side, uh, you know, in terms of impact on human beings and the environment and our ecology and the food chain and all that kind of stuff. Uh, astronomy is kind of an interesting aspect of it, but certainly not the main aspect. Um, another misconception people have is that light pollution is something only touristy locations like the Colorado Plain should be concerned about. It's, it's something for them to worry about and preserve. You know, if you live in a town or a city, we just have to live with it. No, you don't. Uh, there are ways of fixing it and there are reasons why you should fix it. Um, and so that's another misconception. The classic misconception is more lighting is safety. And here I was, uh, I'll slide back and forth between these two images in the corner there. You can see a really bright bulb there uh, on the outdoors of a, of a house gives you the, notion that, that it, it makes you safer because it, it illuminates stuff. But the way I like to put it is you have to remember that the brightest lights cast the darkest shadows as well. And so if you have a really bright light, which is glaring into your eye, it becomes hard to see what's in the darkness, what's lurking in the darkness. And so you have to be careful about that. Um, okay, so, um, we do not want to turn off all the lights, outdoor lights, obviously. Uh, we want the light to be well directed, directed where it needs to go, not go every which way. Um, and so uh, that's another misconception people have. Uh, and then uh, the other conception, misconception people have is in some sense that if laws are uh, implemented about uh, outdoor lighting, light ordinances, for example, then somehow it encroaches on, on my freedom. And that's not right either. Um, just as you're not allowed to trash your neighbor's yard by putting junk 
that you do not want into their yard. Um, excess light is also junk. Light that is misdirected and going where it's not supposed to go is also trash. And just as you're not allowed to trash a neighbor's yard or neighbor's property, you're not allowed, or you shouldn't be allowed ideally, to trash uh, via light uh, their house or their window or what have you. So, so it's not about just about individual freedoms, it's about social responsibility as well. And the right of the individual, it applies to everyone. And your neighbor has the right to not be uh, bothered by what you're doing on your property. LED lights are becoming more and more popular. And so that's a concern as well because uh, LED lights, uh, though are very efficient and that's a good thing, uh, are also very bright uh, simply because they're so efficient. Um, and blue LED lights, which are more popular than say, uh, uh, orange colored LED lights uh, is a concern. Um, and so uh, LED lights are not always better. So that's another misconception. Uh, so I'd, I'd like you to think about these things and, and a few questions I want to raise, which I'll run through relatively quickly. Something to keep at the back of your mind as you listen to this talk or if you're thinking about light pollution is think about, you know, if I show a slide, I mention something, ask if that kind of thing affects you. Does it affect your community? You think it affects your community enough that you should do something about it. And if you feel like, oh, I should do something about it, then obviously the, question, the million dollar question always is where do I start? Uh, and so uh, start thinking about those things. Who can you collaborate with? So on and so forth. Okay, so let's get into the uh, into basic uh, introductions and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, about what we're doing here in Truman and those sorts of things. So what is light pollution? Uh, there are different ways of defining it depending on how strictly you want to define it. Um, we have, uh, um, you know, light that is wasted and doesn't perform any particular function is light pollution. So you can have light trespass, you can have sky glow, you can have glare, light which is not supposed to go where it's supposed to go. And a really strict definition of light pollution uh, you know, no prisoners taken. The Klingon definition of light pollution is any artificial light that you introduce into the environment is light pollution. Doesn't matter whether it's useful or not useful. Any artificial light is light pollution. So that's really the strictest definition you can come up with. But a more practical definition is that first bullet over there, which is it's wasted light that performs no real function. It, it is wasted, it is useless. Uh, you could do without. So here's a pictorial representation of those things. Your street light, you have useful light where it goes onto the street where it's supposed to go. But since that light is not properly shielded, you can see the light is going elsewhere. It's going into what's called a glare zone. There's light trespass occurring because that light, which should be on, going only on the street, is also going into someone's window, into someone's house. Uh, that's not good. That's not ideal. And then a part of that light goes up into the sky and then constitutes or contributes to sky glow. Um, and we're all familiar with this, you know, when it's a clear night and you come home late at night from the restaurant or from a party, uh, if it's very clear, you have to turn on your flashlight to look at your keys or to look at the keyhole. Whereas if it's cloudy, you can pretty much see, especially if you live in a city, you, you can see reasonably well because there's so much light being reflected back from the clouds. Another important thing I want to highlight is that when we talk about light pollution, generally in our, in our mind, we think about the intensity of light, I um, mean, how bright these lights are, which direction they're going, that sort of thing. But it's also very, very important to consider the color of the light. And so when you, buy, when you go to the store and you're buying uh, either outdoor or indoor lights, you are better off checking what the color temperature is. And what you really want are these lower temperature lights, I would say lower than 3000 Kelvin, uh, which appear kind of creamish yellow to orangish in color. And if you look at a light bulb and look at the packing, it usually tell, it gives you this sort of information. It tells you how bright your light is, and it tells you uh, how much energy it is using, and it tells you what the appearance of the light is, whether it's a warmer colored light or whether it's a cooler light. And so uh, you want to buy uh, a warmer light, especially if you're going to use it outdoors. Red light scatters less 
than blue light, and so it contributes less to light pollution in general. It's also more soothing to the eye is red light. Uh, blue light kind of strains your eye a little bit. That's also the reason doctors will tell you that you sh you're not supposed to look at your phone before you go to bed uh, because the phone also, the phone's output also, unless you're using filters, also has a lot of blue light in it. Here are examples of sky glow uh, images that I've taken. Here's the first image, beautiful image of the Milky Way. Uh, I've, took, uh, I've taken uh, in, in Flagstaff, just south of Flagstaff at the Lowell Observatory. Uh, it's a five minute exposure um, and then the tracking was on. As you can see, there's no trailing going on. And a similar image uh, with similar settings taken in Kirksville. Um, and you can see this is only a one minute exposure. I couldn't do five minutes. It would completely wash out the screen. It would just look white because there's so much ambient light coming in. Um, another similar example, now I turned the tracking off and just did some star trails. Flagstaff again, and this is a 30 minute exposure, slightly less than 30 minutes. Um, and here's Kirksville. Again, I did only 15 because going to 30 minutes will start washing things out quite a bit. Uh, I took this from the observatory in Kirksville and you can see uh, the glare from Kirksville town, which is northeast of the observatory towards the bottom left. Towards the left is a state park. Uh, left of the screen is a state park and you see the sky gets considerably darker uh, towards the left over here, uh, whereas it's brighter down here. By the way, can someone tell me, can you look at the mouse when I move the mouse around? Yes. Yeah, we can see you. Okay. Okay, yeah. thank you. All right. Okay. Um, here are examples of good and bad lighting. Uh, you can see this really bright light in the foreground, uh, blaring every which way. Um, and then in the background, you see this nice, this image was taken in, 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 in winter, so you see snow on the ground. Um, and you can see those beautifully shielded lights um, uh, in the background. Some more examples from here in Kirksville. Uh, we have those extraordinarily uh, terrible uh, globe lights, those kind of circular lights, which again, you know, send out most of their light up into the sky rather than towards the ground. Um, and so they're terrible. And then you also have some good lights, as you can see, which are well shielded. Uh, note the light that is shining on this building. And this building happens to be student dorms. And you see all these windows and the light going into the window. So you can, you can ask yourself how we are helping our students if we are shining so much light into their bedrooms. Um, OK, quickly go through um, why studying light pollution is important and why combating and why reversing light pollution or, or stopping light pollution is important. As human beings, we are very uh, egocentric. So we always think about ourselves first. And uh, human health and safety are compromised by bad lighting. Um, like I mentioned, this light that goes into students' windows or your window from the neighbor's yard. Uh, if you know, Human beings have evolved just like other animals to essentially rest at night uh, when the light goes down and then act, get activated during the day when the sun comes up. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it affects our body, it affects the hormones that are secreted by our body, it affects the way in which our body functions if we mess with that diurnal pattern between day and night. And artificial light certainly does that. So we are trying to minimize it as much as possible. There are papers abound, as research abound on secondary tertiary effects of light pollution on human health including all sorts of cancers and mental disorders and, and those sorts of things. Um, I'm not an expert on that. Um, I, from what I've heard from experts and from what I've read, the, the results are kind of mixed because, you know, you can't, human beings are not, you know, rats and guinea pigs. You can't just shine light on them and, and, and control every other uh, thing that is going on in their lives. Uh, so in cities, you know, it's not just the light. There's sound pollution, there's stress, there's uh, air pollution. Who knows what is contributing what to uh, causing certain populations of people to suffer more cancer or, or from more uh, disorders of various kinds. But it doesn't look like light helps in any way. Glare Im impairs our vision uh, while walking on the street, while you're driving, especially if there are really bright lights going into your eye, 
anyone who's driven on a one-way street at night out in the woods and someone from the other side driving the other way comes with their headlights blaring on high, uh, you know what I'm talking about. You know what glare is. You can't see a damn thing. And then you're just hoping for the best that the deer, a deer or something doesn't jump in your, in your way. Uh, but that happens even on college campuses or in, or in downtown areas where you have those globe lights and they're going into people's eyes and people are crossing on sidewalks or, or on crosswalks and cars are driving by, uh, the drivers partly uh, blinded by the glare. Um, apart from humans, other animals are affected as well by light pollution and there's again increasing evidence for this. Bird migration and IDA Missouri has collaborated with the Audubon Society to, to do something about this, at least create awareness. Uh, bird migration is affected by it. Uh, sea turtles get confused as to which, which direction is, is the sea because they see light essentially on both sides. When the sun rises on one side, you have all this city glare on the other side. And there are videos on YouTube where you can see where baby turtles are trampled by ongoing traffic because they're going the wrong way. They're confused. They don't know which direction the sea is. Increasing evidence about insects. Again, we have experts in IDA Missouri who work on insects and insects and light pollution. Um, but dwindling insect population, especially pollinators and fireflies and things like that. Again, there are several factors involved, pesticides, insecticides, uh, uh, other habitat loss, but light pollution is also a factor. Uh, and overall, then, this has an ecological impact uh, because we are disturbing, we are messing with the food chain. All this ties into the entire environment. If you are, 50% of your light is going up into the sky, that's 50% of natural resources you're burning, coal, uh, oil, natural gas, whatever you use is being wasted for no reason. And that obviously affects the greenhouse emissions. We are emitting more pollutants into the atmosphere than we need to if only we could control the light, shield it, direct in the correct direction, and uh, use lower wattage bulbs. Instead of 20 watts, you could get away with 10 watts if you uh, direct it in the correct direction. And then, like I mentioned, there's an astronomical aspect to this as well, where it's just an aesthetic thing, apart from astronomy research and all that. Uh, it just ruins the beauty of the night sky, something that humans and other animals are intrinsically connected to. Uh, very few people go out into a really dark sky, look at the Milky Way or look at Orion through a telescope or look at a beautiful moon even and are not moved by it. Just, it's just an inherent connection. We all, we all we are attracted to it. We always wonder what, what's going on up there. Um, and so um, if you want to keep that connection alive, we, we probably need to do something about light pollution. So again, like I mentioned, astronomy is just one aspect, and I, I actually think it's like a secondary, tertiary aspect. The more important aspects are human health and animal health and our environment. I mean, those are the things that are affected adversely by light pollution, and we need to, we need to fix that for, for the sake of those things rather than what astronomers are saying or not saying. Okay, I'm gonna change gears just a little bit and, and talk about how exactly then do we measure light pollution because if someone says, oh, there's a lot of light pollution, there isn't light pollu as much light pollution, what do you exactly mean? How do you actually measure it objectively and not just subjectively in terms of what someone sees or doesn't see? Uh, there are increasing amounts of, uh, in increasing levels, if you will, increasing levels of sophistication and expense uh, regarding how you can measure it. You can measure it remotely, meaning up from the sky looking down. So either using satellites up above the Earth's atmosphere or even using drones now. Drones are getting more and more popular. You attach a camera to a drone or some sort of light sensor and then you can just fly the drone around. Or you can have ground-based sensors which look up into the sky, like a digital camera looking up into the sky, an all-sky camera. Um, and we also have these sky quality meters, which I'll call SQMs from now on which are what are called single channel sensors uh, because they really have they measure one thing and one thing only in a limited part of the sky uh, from one location. Um, and those are called SQMs. There are advantages and disadvantages to each of these techniques. And again, I don't have the time to go through all of these, but long story short, the remote sensing ones are more expensive, but they can cover a large area, okay? Uh, these guys. 
Whereas these ground-based are more manageable um, individuals or small societies and associations uh, like the IDA Missouri, like SLAS can own one of these sensors, relatively inexpensive, uh, less than $500, certainly. I'll, I'll show you another slide, uh, a, a price range. Uh, but they cover only a certain limited area. So if you put your sensor at one location, well, well you know the light pollution levels at that location. Uh, if you wanna measure the light pollution somewhere else, you have to move the sensor somewhere else, which again is doable, but it's just tedious. But if you have satellite or drones, you can look at a larger swath of land in one go. Here are some sky quality meter costs. Uh, they come in all shapes. Uh, they come in is levels of sophistication, again, in terms of automation and how often you have to change batteries and those sorts of things. Uh, the handheld one is the cheapest one, easiest one to use, very intuitive. You get it for about $130, $135. And then depending on whether you get a weatherproof casing, solar powered batteries and all that, the cost can go up to $350, $370. Uh, if you um, uh, are working with IDA Missouri, we can either get you discounts or we have funding to get uh, uh, sky quality meters. And those are the ones we have used for our program, which are funded by uh, other uh, um, agencies like uh, Space Grant Consortium. Here's an example of an all sky camera. You have a DSLR camera. You, some, most of you have probably heard of DSLR cameras. These are basically digital cameras. And all you have to do is find a fish eye lens. A fish eye lens has a large, uh, it covers a large area in the sky, usually close to 360 degrees so that you can get the whole sky. But to really get a 360 fish eye lens gets prohibitively expensive sometimes, a good quality one. So you can get away with something like 270 or 300 degrees. That covers most of the sky. You don't see parts of the horizon, but big deal. Uh, you can live with that. Um, the trick is to go from a all sky image like this uh, and to kind of a sky brightness uh, conversion. So you have an image which has digital information. You need some sort of a software to convert that digital information of the image into numbers numbers that are correlated to sky brightness. So you can say, oh, this part of the sky is darker, that part of the sky is brighter, that part of the sky is brighter, because maybe there's a nearby town, maybe there's a football field, maybe there's a uh, gas station or, or, or a car dealership or, or what have you. Uh, so this conversion is tricky. Uh, it requires special software to do it consistently. Uh, and people are working on it. Rebus et al. Have, have a Stars for All program. They published a paper back in 2017, which outlines one such program. I haven't used it yet, but I plan on using it soon. DSLR cameras with fisheye lenses you can get for uh, up less than $1,000. So around $1,000 if you want a really good quality one. So not cheap, but not prohibitively expensive either. Like I mentioned, another way of measuring light pollution is satellite mapping. This is a classic image you've seen all over the place. Nat Geo was the first one that published it a few years ago. Um, and uh, you see uh, some of this is model dependent, is, is simulated obviously 2025, we are not there yet. But the, the extrapolation based on the rate at which light pollution is increasing across the United States, uh, it seems like 2025, everything essentially east of the Mississippi is a loss. Um, uh, except that little blob over there, you see the dark spot over there, that region over there is Appalachia, it's, it's West Virginia. And so West Virginia is still lagging behind um, in terms of development as much as these other places are. And so that's that. And then a couple of other, again, this is all the Appalachian uh, mountains over here. So you see uh, um, those are lagging behind, but everywhere else, it's kind of a loss. And we'll start losing some of uh, the, the Colorado Plateau as well, as you can see. So Flagstaff is somewhere down there and you see, uh, you start losing some of that as well um, as time goes on. Look how dark it is in the 50s and even the 70s and look how bad it's gonna get in the next 10 or 15 years. Um, there's a satellite called the VIRS satellite, the VIRS satellite. Uh, you can go to this website, lightpollutionmap.info uh, and look up your location and you can click on that map and it tells you what the sky brightness is. I'll show you an example later in the talk if we have time. Um, uh, 
it's the, the, the VIRS map is, is a little uh, tricky to understand in, in, in the sense if you go into the technical details as to exactly what is being measured and how it's being measured. Um, there is one drawback or one limitation to this mapping right now, which is that the map is constructed using a sensor uh, aboard a satellite up in the sky, which is sensitive to about 0.5 to 0.9 micrometers. So it goes into the red and infrared pretty good but it is a cutoff at about 0.5 micrometers. So really blue light, like LED blue lights, which have a, which have a small peak around 0.45, uh, 0.45 micrometers, uh, the VIR satellite actually is not catching that. So the light pollution the VIR satellite is, is measuring is actually kind of an underestimate. It's not catching some of these LED lights that are going off, uh, off late as LEDs become more popular. Uh, so the satellite mapping and the sky quality meters, uh, the all sky maps, these are all objective ways of measuring uh, and quantifying light pollution. There are more subjective waves as well, which are, which are popular because you, you don't need any special instrumentation. You can do it with your eye. And the most popular of those is this bottle scale, which essentially is a measure of how clearly you can see the sky from a given location. The bottle scale goes essentially from one, meaning excellent skies, you can't get better than this. You can see the Milky Way. You can see all uh, the bright kind of, you know, deep sky objects, those sorts of things. And then it gets successively worse from one to nine, uh, where eight and nine is suburban sky, uh, is urban sky, in the middle of downtown St. Louis, middle of downtown Kansas City. And you look up and you pre pretty much see nothing in the sky. Maybe you might see the moon. Maybe you might see Jupiter or Venus if they're up. Um, most of us, I'm guessing, if you live in suburban St. Louis or suburban Kansas City or then smaller towns like I do are dealing with something like three, four, five, six kind of skies. Uh, if you go out into the woods, uh, especially if you live in southeast Missouri, uh, then um, you start seeing uh, darker skies. So southeast Missouri down here. So again, that's St. Louis, Kansas City, Springfield. Uh, that's Highway 63, which is relevant for me. That's Kirksville up there where I am. That's Columbia, Missouri. That's I-70 over there. And so if you go down, and this is I-55 going down here. Uh, so if you're down here, then uh, we see these are the darkest skies that we have in our state. That's where you can expect something close to twos. Maybe if you're lucky on a really transparent night, you might get a border scale one. Uh, I don't expect you to read all this. This is just from the original border uh, paper from 2001 which defines what border scale one, two, three, four means. And since we have many astronomers in our group here today, many uh, members of SLAS, you know some of these objects. So you might, you might wanna take this, uh, this slide, you can look it up online uh, and see what are the kinds of objects you can see for a border scale nine as against say border scale four or five or border scale one. You know most of these objects in the sky. You've, you've probably seen them through a telescope, you've probably seen them with a the, with the naked eye as well. Okay, the bottle scale, the drawback is that it's subjective. It depends from person to person. The advantage is anybody can do it. All these other things we need instruments for. So light pollution is measured in terms of a quantity called sky brightness. Uh, sky brightness is measured in these weird astro units called a magnitude per arc second squared. Uh, I'm not gonna worry explaining what that is to you. It's, 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 it's an astronomy term and astronomers use weird units for whatever reason. Uh, the important thing for us is to remember as we proceed through the talk is the darkest skies as measured by our sky quality meters are about 22 units. Okay, 22 is the darkest sky. If you go to downtown St. Louis and look up into the sky away from any street lights, so you're not looking straight into a street light, you're looking at the sky above the light line, if you will. Those skies, on a clear night, you can expect readings between 17 to about 18 or 19. Okay, so 22 is the darkest. 16, 17 are some of the worst skies you can probably imagine on a clear night. On cloudy nights, things get a little cloudier. Um, stars themselves have light, obviously. That's how we see them. And so the darkest sky would be devoid of any stars because stars themselves give you some light and depending on which star is out, is Sirius out? And stars includes planets in this case. So if Jupiter is out, Saturn is out, Venus is out, 
obviously that's going to affect things. So natural starlight can be as bright as 21.4 and as dark as 21.9. So not quite 22, but 20, you know, mid 21s, if you will. If you see the bulge of the Milky Way, which is hard for us in the Northern Hemisphere, but if you go to the Southern Hemisphere, the bulge of the Milky Way gets overhead uh, and that can actually get really bright, surprisingly bright. People tell me that you can see your shadow from the Milky Way uh, in certain places where it's really dark. And the bulge of the Milky Way can get as bright as 20.5 units. So again, higher the number, the darker the sky, lower the number, the brighter the sky, okay? Uh, it's like golf, the, 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 it's, the more negative your score, the better off you are. It's kind of similar. The darker the sky, the bigger your number is going to be. Okay. Um, one thing I want to emphasize here, I'll just leave it as a, as a comment and, and move, move along because this is still an evolving field, is you have all these different units, different ways of measuring sky brightnesses. And we need to standardize this because if I measure the sky brightness at one location and then someone else measures the sky brightness at another location, if you want to be objective about it, we should be consistent. We should compare apples with apples and oranges with oranges. If you're using different techniques, different zero points, uh, different conventions, then it becomes harder. And so astronomers and other um, uh, scientists are working towards an objective way of quantifying sky brightness, uh, just as uh, astronomers have done for star brightnesses. Uh, and so this is a it's an important challenge because apart from the sky, measuring sky brightness objectively, part of the problem, like I mentioned uh, when I talked about the Veer satellite is the quality of outdoor lighting is changing. Not, not, not just the quantity, the quality is changing as well because people are using it, more and more people are using LED lights, which are bluer and bluer. And so that becomes a problem. Uh, I don't know what happened over there. I'm sorry. I think I I activated my <laughs> Facebook page and it kind of acted up. Okay. All right. So it's an important challenge to keep in mind. Okay. So let me now focus on our research and our outreach, and then I'll talk about what we're doing with ID in Missouri and show you a bunch of plots and, and try and draw your attention to what they mean. Our main objective recent, uh, in the last two or three years has been research. We're trying to quantify light pollution, just like I mentioned. It's important to quantify it in a consistent way so that we can compare it. So we do it in several different ways. I've listed them here. Once we have quantified the problem, then we can take action. We can say, okay, what do we need to do about this? And we don't have to wait for it. We can do this simultaneously. And in order to generate enough groundswell, if you will, enough momentum for that, for those actions to be taken, we need outreach. We need to create awareness. And so we're taking this three-pronged approach is quantify, talk to people about it, create awareness, and then do something about it. And for my research group, I have told my research students, it's not just sitting in front of a computer, collecting data and analyzing. Sure, we'll do some of that. We'll do a lot of that actually, but we have to do these other things as well. And so uh, I've been involved in all three aspects of this, some more than others over time, but, but you know, I'm keep, I'm, I try and keep my eyes on all three of these uh, facets of, of, of light pollution, because it's not just enough doing research and publishing papers. It's not just enough talking about it. We need to do something about it. My research has been funded by the NASA Missouri Space Grants Consortium since 2015, so about four, four and a half years now. Uh, it's also supported by Truman State University and 12 undergraduate students have been involved in this research over the past four years most of them have graduated and have gone to do better and better things. Uh, Andrew is still working with me, Andrew Gentry, and Joey Mott is still working, although he's taken a break for the summer. Um, and Andrew, I'll, I'll show you some of Andrew's work a little bit later in the talk. Uh, collected data uh, as part of our research in Kurtzwell and in Flagstaff, Arizona. And in the last six to eight months, we have now extended this to uh, 12 to 15 different sites across the state of Missouri, which I'll talk about 
in a minute as well. The primary research question that I am trying to address, my research group is trying to address is, yes, we have light pollution. We measure light pollution in terms of sky brightness and we measure sky brightness by using sky quality meters. So in an ideal world, your sky quality meter will measure the sky brightness and you'll say, okay, here are the results. This is what the sky quality meter is telling us. And that measurement will depend on one and one thing only, which is the location and how much light pollution it has. Unfortunately, um, that's not the only thing that the quality, sky quality me meter measures or the sky quality meter reading depends on many other things apart from the light pollution level. And these are primarily weather conditions and then the quirks of a particular location. So weather conditions like, was it cloudy? Was the moon out? Uh, was it humid? The sky brightness itself will affect your readings. How bright is the sky? Are you measuring in the middle of nowhere? Uh, are, are you measuring in the middle of, middle, middle of a well-populated city? And then the location itself in terms of, is there a big wall nearby? Are there trees nearby? Uh, is, are you on a dusty road? Meaning there's so much traffic on a dusty road that the dust goes and settles on your meter and affects the readings. So those sorts of peculiarities of, of the location. And so we have to be cognizant of these things and we have to account for these things as much as possible. So the primary question my research group is trying to address over the last six months, and we're gonna continue this over the next year or so is, how do local weather conditions affect what you measure? Okay, and I'll, I'll show you some results from that as we go along. In fact, here they are. Here's a plot, I'll explain the plots in a minute. For the time being, the y-axis is how bright the sky is. The higher the reading, the darker the sky, the lower the reading, the brighter the sky. And the x-axis here is just time, starting around when it gets dark, which is about here, near zero. And then the night goes along like this. This data were taken in winter, January, early Jan last year. And so you have a very long night as you can see. And you see, these are three plots collected at three different locations. One was a rural location, the blue curve, the topmost curve. The middle curve was on top of my house, which is semi-rural. And then the bottom one was in, on top of this very building where I'm sitting, right in the middle of Curse. And so you see, uh, there's a lot of action over here, some weird stuff over here, then it kind of stabilizes and kind of flattens all these three curves. So what is all this? So I have an all sky camera set up out at the observatory here about a couple of miles from where I'm sitting. And I'll show you three images at three different times and that will give you an idea of what's going on. The first image on the top left, this is an all sky image, was taken around the time over here around 8 p.m. And you see it's very cloudy. This this image where this little blip is was taken when the sky looked like this. You see a band of clouds pass by. And this image where this, these data are more or less flat is taken when the sky was absolutely clear. So you see when it is clear, so let's look at the topmost curve. When it is clear, the sky is much darker than when it was cloudy, which intuitively makes sense. Okay? Because the clouds are going to reflect back the light that was going up into the sky. So you can quantify light pollution in terms of how much light is being reflected back by our cloud cover over here. Here's another example on an absolutely clear night, just, to, just the next night as it happens. And you see, you can see Orion down here if you're attentive and if your screen resolution is good enough. Um, you can see uh, Orion over there, you can see absolutely clear sky throughout and more or less flat curves. This slight inflection over here gets darker. Question is why? This gets slightly darker. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Another night where it got cloudy, then it got clear, then it got cloudy, kind of oscillated back and forth. And you see our readings are jumping up and down like crazy because the clouds are coming in, going out. The cloud, it's not a very thick cloud cover. So if it's slightly thick, it's reflecting more light. If it's just high still, it's not reflecting as much. And so your readings just kind of bounce up and down. So a lot of action over here, a lot of, lot of data that is open to interpretation. What exactly is going on? I want to show you one more plot, and this is, looks slightly different. Uh, it's from Flagstaff. Same scheme. Uh, the sky, all sky images here are taken from Flagstaff's all sky camera. They are more sophisticated camera than I do. 
And here's an interesting thing. Now look at what's going on over here, okay? In the Kurtzville locations, these, all these three uh, meters are at Kurtzville, all these three curves are Kurtzville essentially, slightly out of town, in town. When it is cloudy, yes, when it is cloudy, my sky gets brighter. My readings go down, okay? My sky gets brighter. Look at what happens in, sorry, well, look at what happens in Flagstaff. This topmost curve is where these images were taken on a cloudy night. In Flagstaff, Arizona, at Lowell Observatory, south of Flagstaff, the sky gets darker when it is cloudy. Okay? It gets brighter in Kirksville when it is cloudy. The sky gets darker in Flagstaff at Lowell Observatory, south of Flagstaff, when it is cloudy. And I already told you why that is the case. Remember, I told you stars give off light. And so if you block the stars out and if you do not have light pollution for that to reflect back from the base of the clouds, the clouds are gonna be dark. And so if you block out the starlight, you're gonna get darker skies, okay? So that's the kind of thing I'm interested in is to see how clouds, for example, affect sky brightness. And as you can already see, depending on your level of sky, level of, uh, level of light pollution, the clouds are gonna play either a, in an amplifying role in sky brightness or they are gonna actually decrease sky brightness. All right. Apart from research, we have taken some actions here at Truman State. We were uh, highlighted on NPR uh, at uh, the St. Louis Public Radio uh, about a year ago, um, uh, some of this work. Um, and we have started installing what are called dark sky reflectors and we have started changing the color, you can see in this image over here on the right, from blue white to slightly more creamish white or yellowish in color. So you're moving from 5,000K light to 3,000K light. I must say that that's still not good enough. We need to do better because even 3,000K contains a lot of blue light, which is not good. So we're working towards getting even better. The dark sky reflector shields we are using are also kind of iffy. They're, they're okay, they, do, they serve some purpose, but you can do better. I'm trying to get the university to chip in and I'll chip in with some of my grant money to just replace these, these, these uh, fixtures. These fixtures are absolutely horrible. Uh, you know, you, there's only these many band-aids you can apply to it. Uh, I'll just go on a little rant over here. You look at this light fixture over here on the left. Look at this base plate over here the base plate that holds this light fixture. It's dark and opaque, meaning whatever light is shining from in here, practically none of it is going downwards because it's blocked by this base plate. Most of the light is going sideways or if this shield didn't exist, it will go up into the sky. It, it's just absolutely horrible. Uh, and so, yes, we're doing something to try and fix it, but again, these are just band-aids. We just need to replace them uh, and we'll work towards them. We are working towards them. Okay, so this is about what we're doing here at Truman in Kirksville, and I want to extend that now and talk about our IDA Missouri program. And this is a rationale for, there's too much text here, so I, I'm, not, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things. We have installed 12 and we're moving towards another four or five, so about 15, give or take, SQMs, sky quality meters, uh, in 15 different locations across our state. Local volunteers collect the data, download the data, and then email it to me and then my students and I analyze it. So that's how we are working um, uh, with, with the sky quality meter program uh, under IDM Missouri. And we want to automate this process and I'll show you some examples of automation a little bit later. Uh, and um, we want local authorities to get involved. We want local authorities to uh, use some of these data uh, and impress upon the powers that be that things need to change because we can now compare how bright, say, Rolla is as compared to the city of Ozark, as compared to Perryville, as com compared to various parks and locations in St. Louis, Kansas City, uh, and so on and so forth, Columbia, Kirksville, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's the rationale for the program. Involve people from across the state quantify the problem, and then influence authorities to make corresponding changes. 
here is a map of uh, where we are located, uh, where these sky quality meters are located right now. And we're gonna add some more as, uh, as more of these come online. Um, and here's a list of these uh, uh, locations. Uh, and I'll show you data from some of these, again, in the interest of time, unfortunately, I cannot show you all the data that we have. You'll, you'll already get overwhelmed by the amount of data I'm gonna throw at you in a minute. Uh, but there's much, much more, and we're working towards streamlining it and extracting as much valuable information as possible. Again, a few of our collaborators and pictures that I could find on, on, on the IDM Missouri website. I apologize for the ones that are not here. I couldn't find a neat picture I could, I could throw up there. Um, but uh, here are some, about eight of the about 12 that are operational right now. Um, so I mentioned some of these things already. So a quick Quick overview before I start talking about plots and then I'm probably gonna run out of time in another 10 minutes or so. So, uh, so our volunteers collect the data, send it to us about two weeks to a month. Uh, we're working towards automating it. And then we are interested in studying what factors influence what sky brightness is measured. Weather is an important criteria and moon phase is a very important criteria. And we get weather data from one of uh, NOA websites. Uh, I have the link here. Uh, this talk, by the way, will be freely available on my website, and then I'm going to email it to Jim as well, and then he can share it with you guys. We'll put it on IDM Missouri's website, so you can find all those links in this uh, this talk and the links therein uh, if you need it. Um, and you can download data for several years, if not decades, going back, and you get data data in the form of an Excel file. Uh, for whatever day or set of days that you want the data for. Um, and it's usually about, the cadence is about 30 minutes. So it says 30 minutes clear, you know, 12 o'clock clear, 12.30 clear, one o'clock cloudy or partly cloudy or whatever. And it also gives you humidity. It also gives you dew point temperatures. It gives you a bunch of other stuff that might be relevant. Um, so I've been collecting data since last October on at least five or six sites now. Uh, more and more sites are coming online. More and more data is being sent to us as, as people collect these data, download it, and send it to us. And we look at a few plots. And like I said, I'm going to show you a bunch of plots now, which could potentially overwhelm you. So, so the plot is going to thicken now, uh, as Colbert would say. Um, and so here we go. So here the, here's the nature of the plots. Uh, whenever you look at a plot, you want to look at the axes first. So this plot is a blank plot right now. I haven't plotted anything there, so I can show you the axes. The y-axis is the sky quality meter reading. Again, remember, the higher the reading, the darker the sky, the lower the reading, the brighter the sky. So day would be zero over here in this reading. The x-axis is just time starting at noon of a particular day and ending at noon the next day. So 12 over here is essentially midnight, okay? So a day would be basically zero reading. It's so bright that your meter doesn't even measure it, just sets it to zero. I will also show you satellite data on some of these plots. Satellite, weird satellite data, which you can, I'll show you how you can uh, get these numbers. But that's just a static reading, which was uh, measured in 2015 using the weird satellite data for a particular location and this one happens to be Science Center, the Science Center in St. Louis. The VE satellite data says where our sensor is installed around it, the sky quality reading, the sky brightness reading is about 17.6 17, 17 units. So I just put a horizontal line there representing 17.6. And here's our reading for a particular night. The night date is over here to the top right. For that particular night, we started off daytime and then as twilight comes in and the sky gets darker and darker, my sky readings get darker and darker, higher and higher. And then once it's night, it remains more or less steady, as you can see. It's a little bright, a little darker, as you can see. And as twilight comes again, as dawn twilight comes in again, uh, the readings start falling, the sky is getting brighter, and then you hit day again, and then it just goes to zero. So that's the nature of these plots that I'm going to show you in the next uh, few slides. Okay, here's another plot from Perryville on the 26th of December last year. And again, it's, it's bright, it's daytime, it's uh, twilight sets in, uh, dusk twilight, and gets dark. And you see the data are now slightly jaggedy. You can see the previous plot, the data were reasonably flat or smooth. 
here you can see the data is kind of jumping up and down a little bit, a little spike over here. And somewhere around two o'clock at night, one o'clock, two o'clock at night, uh, something seems to have happened and my reading just fell suddenly very quickly and then settled down again for a lower reading about 17. It used to be about 20 and something happened around one o'clock and then it went down to about 19 set there and then again twilight set in, in um, um, uh, during dawn. So the question is what happened here? What, what is this data telling us? What, what can you learn from this? Okay, before we answer those sorts of questions, here is a simultaneous plot for several nights for Mineral Area College in Southeast Missouri. And again, you can see some nights, nice readings of about 20, other nights like this kind of cyan curve readings of about 16, a difference of about four units. Uh, so what's going on? And then the, these data in between are just jumping all over the place as well. Something funny is happening over here. So again, these data are very, these plots are very dense. They, they have a lot of information in them, which we need to extract. Here's the same plot, but I have plotted it as an animation just for the heck of it. Uh, just one night to the other, how it changes. Kind of fun to look at. Here's data from the city of Ozark. I've just put it on, now that you're familiar with the plots, I just put them all together uh, as a, as a, as a um, um, uh, montage. And you can see again, more or less flat, a little jaggedy, but it has this weird curvature around midnight. You see again, this weird curvature Again, that curvature, and the curvature seems to be going later and later into the night. Some of you should be able to tell me uh, or tell yourselves because you're muted, <laughs> uh, what is going on here. So why the jaggedness sometimes and smoothness on other times and why this kind of secular dip and then secular increase and that's, that dip and increase shifting later and later into the night. Most of you, I'm guessing, should be able to guess what causes these Things. Okay, here's a slightly different looking plot, but the same logic again. Y-axis is again our sky brightness. The higher the reading, the darker the sky, lower the reading, brighter the sky. This is time. Now I just plotted noon to noon again. That's midnight over there. Uh, this plot, by the way, was made by Andrew, uh, who is one of my students working with me right now. And what he did was even fancier. What he did was he looked up cloud data from the NOAA website for Rala for these nights. And then he's plotted the cloud cover on the y-axis on the right panel, zero cloud cover, zero is coded, meaning zero corresponds to clear skies, eight corresponds to overcast skies, and then in between are partly cloudy skies, okay? So something like this is partly cloudy over here, partly cloudy over here, but absolutely clear there, absolutely cloudy there. So see cloudy sky, you see a lot of jaggedness, lower readings as compared to a clear sky, clear sky and higher readings. And on this night again, you see, and this answers one of the questions I raised earlier, why that sudden jump every now and then on some nights. That earlier data I showed you was for Perival. This is for Rala, but same logic holds. It was clear earlier on this particular night, the night of 27th December, 2019. It was clear initially and it slowly got cloudy between 9 p.m. and midnight. And as it got cloudy, you see the sky's quality readings were much higher, about 19 over here. And then once it got completely overcast, you can see the readings just jumped down from about 19 to about 15 because of that same reason that I mentioned. The sky quality meter is installed in the city limits of Rolla. It's on the science building there in, uh, at Missouri s &T. And when it was clear, you got darker readings. As soon as clouds set in, an overcast sky reflected back all this light going up into the sky. And you see that that reflects in our sky quality meter readings. Here's Rala again. And again, you see this weird pattern, this concave kind of dip. And again, that's the moon in case you hadn't guessed already. If the moon gets into the field of view of your sensor, then it's gonna affect your reading. It's like as if you're shining light straight into the sensor, obviously you're gonna get a brighter reading. So it gets brighter when the moon is kind of getting into the field of view of your sensor. And as you know, as the moon phases and moon rises earlier and later, um, you can see this curve shift uh, as well. So that clearly tells you it's the moon. So this one, you can see both the effects of clouds as well as the moon. Again, the blue dot dash line is showing us the cloud cover. Zero corresponds to clear skies. Higher readings on the cloud cover corresponds to cloudy skies. And again, wherever it's cloudy, you see the curves get jaggedy 
whenever it's clear, you see the curves are nice and smooth. Comparison between different locations. I have six locations plotted here. Hillsboro, Perry, uh, Perry County, City of Ozark, Mineral Area, Southeast Missouri, and then Rolla. And you can again see this is for the 26th where you had this beautiful cloud cover. Kirksville, unfortunately, was completely cloudy already all night, but that cloud cover shifted further south, southeast through the night. And you can actually see that Rolla gets cloudy first, then you get Ozark, you know, then you get Simo um, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then Perryville kind of towards the end along with Mineral Area because they are farthest east, southeast from as compared to these other locations. And so um, you can see clear skies earlier, uh, flat readings, higher readings, and then it gets cloudy and then um, your readings go down, your sky gets brighter. Okay, here's an automated Raspberry Pi that I have installed on the roof of this building and then out at the observatory at Truman. Um, and you can see, uh, I'm not gonna play this whole thing. This runs for the whole year, uh, not for the whole year, but starting from this year up to last night. Um, and I can play this game uh, all night long. And since it's automated, uh, you can see the pink background or kind of the salmon, light salmon colored background uh, is moon. And you see the moon face shown to the top right. And whenever the moon is up, it's shaded kind of light salmon colored. Uh, and so you can do the analysis then. You have the cloud cover from the NOA website, and then you have um, um, the moon phase from this program, and then you can uh, go ahead and do your analysis. This is just averages from uh, mineral area. So now the x-axis is not just ours for one day or one night. It's from uh, December, uh, oh, sorry, uh, 31st October up to, uh, up to early March. Um, and you can see just these, each dot here is an average sky quality meter reading for that location for that night, okay? And I've averaged two hours either side of midnight because I didn't want to count dawn and dusk readings because that will obviously skew my readings. Um, I haven't accounted for cloud cover. I haven't accounted for moon yet, but that's the next stage of my research. And my student is writing a program to do just that is extract out which nights were cloudy, which nights were clear, extract out which night the moon was up and how, how, what phase it was in. And then we can parse these data a little bit better. But we can still look at an average. The brightest it gets in mineral area is about 20. The faintest, this looks to be an outlier, but the faintest it gets is about 15. Um, and then the average is somewhere around 18, I suppose. Uh, as compared to city of Ozark, city of Ozark never gets as dark as 20. It gets as dark as maybe 19.5. Nothing wrong with city of Ozark, it's just a location. It's in the middle of the city, uh, whereas mineral area is, is, is not as big a city as Ozark, and the college campus is a little darker than uh, downtown city of Ozark. Um, here's Rolla, same plot, uh, averages night to night, and you see it kind of shifts down as I go. The, the, the frame doesn't shift, but the, the data point shift, because again, Rolla, much brighter, much bigger city. The brightest you get is about, I would say, less than 19, certainly, uh, just about 19, I suppose, 19.2, something like that. And the darkest it gets is as much as 14, 14.5. 14 so again, the averages tell us something, okay? Again, we have to uh, take it with a little bit of grain of salt because I haven't, haven't accounted for clouds and I haven't accounted for moon phase yet, but we are working on that. Here's CMO, same thing. CMO uh, data I haven't analyzed all the way. Something weird happened on CMO. One of the nights, the reading was 23. <laughs> it was clearly a malfunction. I'm still looking into what happened there. Uh, you can't get 23s on your sky quality meter. 22 is the darkest you can get. So something weird happened there. But everything else looks fine. Uh, again, uh, about 19 is the average. The darkness is about 14 and a half, 15, I suppose. Uh, the darkest uh, was 14 over there. So again, we are parsing these data. We're trying to figure out what's going on. This is what I want to... This is the table I want to fill up. This is the aim of this research, if you will. For each of these locations, I want the average sky quality meter reading on a clear night, moonless clear night. And I want the average sky quality meter reading on a cloudy moonless night. And I want to compare those values because my working hypothesis, which intuitively makes sense, is that in a more dark polluted sky, when you have cloud cover, 
your sky will get much, much brighter than in a cloudy sky in a dark location to begin with. And that's the hypothesis I want to test. And I want to test what is the difference level between a clear sky and a cloudy sky at these various locations and what that tells us about the ambient light at that location. So that's, this is a table. We have the data. We are just parsing it right now. We're trying to figure out how to analyze it consistently, accurately, and it works for every location um, so that we can fill up this table. Okay, I'll talk about one more thing. Uh, Jim, can you tell me how much time I have? Uh, due to the def technical difficulties, we're going to give you to midnight. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank um, you. No problem. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I'll probably go another 10, 15 minutes, okay? All right. Uh, okay, so we have, uh, I mentioned this light, uh, light pollution map.info website. It's a very handy website uh, because you can play the following game on. You can look up whatever location you want to look up, say Thousand Hills State Park. And there are various tools. You can click on the one of these tools, and then if you click at a particular location, so when I search for Thousand Hill State Parks, it puts a, a pin over there. And if I click on that pin and I kind of drag or move my mouse away, I can make a circle of increasing radii. So I can go and make a five kilometer, it, it's in kilometers, not in miles, but you know, uh, good enough. Um, you can either do five kilometers or six kilometers or 10 kilometers or whatever. So my student and I are working on looking at state parks across the state. This is something that IDA Missouri already has tabulated on their website, but we are adding to it a little bit by doing the following. We're gonna to go to some of these state parks and then look up within a 10 kilometer radius if there are any prominent towns in that radius. So Kirksville obviously is right next door to Thousand Hill State Park, less than five kilometers away. And then we also have a small town called Novinger. There's also Youngstown over there. A couple of other smaller towns that are not shown over here. But we're going to look at those towns, how far they are. So if you look at the table at the bottom over here, how far these towns are, and what is the average sky quality meter reading in those towns? So if I click at any given location on this map, it opens up this box, and it tells me what the sky quality meter reading average is. So you can either choose a area, or you can just click randomly somewhere and it will tell you what the sky quality meter is. So if I click randomly in various locations in Kirksville, it gives me five or six, depending on where, how many times I click, it gives me five or six uh, readings uh, of, sky, of sky brightness. And I can take the average of that and that's what I've tabulated here in this column at the bottom. Okay, the fourth column here. So Kirksville reasonably bright. Youngstown is a really small town, so not much action there in terms of light pollution. And Norwinger is also not bad. And then I can also play the same game with, with the park itself. And I, this is what I get for the average sky brightness of the park. 21.34 is not bad, but it's not great either. Okay, this, 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 scale, this scale that maxes out at 22 is really scrunched. So even though 21.34 doesn't sound terribly different than 22, it's a, what's called a logarithmic scale. And so even though the numbers are not very different, the brightness values actually are quite different. 21.34 would be bottle scale, I don't know, five or six. 22 would be bottle scale nine. And that's a huge difference, okay? So the game we are playing is, we are asking why certain parks are not as dark as certain other parks. And I don't have it here, but you can click on some other park uh, and then it tells you the average sky brightness in that park is about 21.9. And then you draw this radius around that park, and then you see there are no big towns in the vicinity. And that clearly tells you that the park skies are being affected by nearby towns. And so this is the game we want to play. IDA Missouri has a program that already is doing some of this, and we're going to add to it saying, you can go to the park rangers, you can go to the park officials and tell them, and we can go to the city managers and tell them, Look, you have this beautiful park right next door, five, 10 kilometers away from the city. The park has natural beauty. It has beautiful, it is supposed to have beautiful dark skies. It has a lot of game in the sense of there's lots of deer, wildlife of all kind. And of course, most parks, in fact, all parks hunting is not allowed, 
but around most parks there are hunting areas, right? There are conservation areas and whatnot. And so if you want to attract tourists to your park and your conservation areas, you are better off having dark skies because if the skies keep getting brighter and brighter with increased usage of LED lights, then it's going to scare animals and birds away. So we have birders, we have hunters, we have naturalists, we have amateur astronomers and stargazers. All of these people, apart from your health and the health of the environment, simply from in terms of dollar bills, right? In terms of dollar bills, many small towns down in the Ozarks, uh, near Columbia, there are a couple of parks near St. Louis, south of St. Louis, lots of parks. Uh, north of Kansas City, west of Kansas City, near Chillicothe, there are sort of lots of dark, dark areas. But if you start losing those dark areas, we start losing those hunting opportunities, we start losing those natural beauty, uh, we start losing that natural beauty, tourism is going to get affected. And so many of these small towns, including Kirksville, uh, a lot of our economy, a significant fraction of our economy depends on tourists on hunters, on naturalists, on birders who come to our town. Uh, they go to the park during the day or night and then they stay in our town or they stay, uh, go to our restaurants or go to Walmart or whatever to you know, buy supplies of food, those sorts of things. And so we want to influence, we want to have, common sense tells us this is true, but we want, we want to have objective data that tells us nearby towns are affecting the sky brightness in, in our parks and conservation areas. And one sure shot way of doing that, apart from playing this game that I've showed you over here, which is we can click on different parks and we can clearly see the darker the park, the less likely it is that there's a nearby city or town. But we can also conclusively prove that by doing what are called angle measurements on sky brightness. So our sky quality meters that I've been talking about until now, the weird satellite data that is giving us this information over here on this map, all of that is basically measuring the sky brightness straight up in the sky at the zenith, okay? But as all of you know, if you just look out in the night sky, the sky brightness is not uniform across the sky. It changes and it's most light polluted near the horizon and it kind of gets better and better as you go towards the zenith. So again, if you just look at the zenith readings, almost always the zenith rating is an underestimate of how light polluted your sky actually is because the zenith is expected to be the darkest part of the sky. And so if you want to go hunting or if you want to go look at the Milky Way from a particular location, you look up the zenith sky brightness from either the light pollution map or from a light meter, it's going to say it's 21.9 or whatever. And you say, oh, this is a beautiful dark park. I can go there. But when you actually go there, you notice that south of the city, uh, south of the park, there's this really bright town or city or the park ranger's office is over there with bad lighting or whatever. And the south part of the sky is washed out because of light pollution. And there, you lost your Milky Way right there because you know from, our, from Missouri, for the most part, the best part of the Milky Way is close to the southern horizon. So how do we get directional information? Because we don't have directional information from uh, satellite data or from sky quality meter rate. Data. So here's the game we play. You can take handheld light quality meters, mount them on a stand, stick a protractor to it, and put a plumb bob on. So this is a plumb bob hanging over here. I don't know if you can see it. There's a plumb bob, and the protractor, you can then change the angle of your uh, stand. The protractor will tell you what angle you're looking at with the help of the plumb bob. And you can say, okay, in the east direction, I'm looking 20 degrees above the horizon, 30 degrees above the horizon, 40 degrees above the horizon, et cetera, et cetera, up to zenith. Then go to the north part of the sky and then again change the angle. Go to the west, go to the east, play that game. Uh, and you can measure the light pollution at every setting. And here's an example plot of that. Now this plot is slightly different. The y-axis is the same. Higher the readings, the darker the sky. Lower the readings, the brighter the sky. And then now the x-axis is not time anymore. It's angle with respect, to the z, uh, uh, with respect to the horizon. So 90 degrees over here is the zenith. And then I've taken four different readings in four different directions. So I placed my setup facing east, then north, west, then south, and then kept changing the angle. And then I measured what sky quality, uh, what sky brightness I'm getting. And you see on the horizon, it's the worst, as you would expect, where you live nearby, near a city. 
at the zenith, the readings converge as they should because we're looking straight up. It doesn't matter which direction you came from. It should give you the same readings. But you can clearly see the west part of the sky for us is the darkest. Again, remember the higher the readings, the darker the sky. And the east part of the sky is the worst, which makes sense for this readings was taken at the observatory. The observatory is southwest of campus. So we expect the northeast to be the worst. So east and north are the worst and then south and west are the best, okay? So we can play this game and this will conclusively show because if we can go, for example, to Thousand Hills and we play the same game that I just showed you that we did at the observatory, I would expect west and south to give me the darkest readings, north and east and east being especially terrible and even north because there's a lot of light leaking in here, north of town as well, north and east to give me the worst readings. And if you can show that to the authorities, we can say, well, Kirksville, you know, city managers, tourism people at Kirksville, if you want to stop Thousand Hills from getting ruined vis-a-vis -vis light pollution, you need to do something about it because these relatively average, not bad, but relatively average sky quality meter reading I'm getting at Thousand Hills is primarily because of this. It's because of Kirksville and I can prove it by saying my east direction from the park is the worst, north is the next worst, west is the next worst, and south is the best, or something like that, and show it to them what's going on. And like I said, the only, or one of the only ways, one of the main ways in which you get people to change their behavior is by telling them it's gonna affect their bottom line, right? It's gonna affect tourism money. Uh, that might get them to change it. If I tell you it affects animal health, it affects bird migration and all that, People are interested, people are intrigued, but it doesn't necessarily move them to take action. And so we want to tell our city people, our town people, uh, town managers, city managers, city mayor, town mayor, that we need to change the tourism people that we need to change for uh, these reasons, because you can see what the town light is doing to us. Okay, a couple of slides still to go, but these are three things. Things, if, you, if you're already interested in this topic or if anything I said during this talk got you interested in it, here are three things I think you should do in the relatively near future, uh, preferably tonight if you can. But I know people are busy and, you know, and those sorts of things. But try and do it this weekend. If you have a couple of hours, that's all it will take for the first two things. The third point here takes a little longer. Go to the darkskymissouri.org website. Uh, I have to give credit here to Don and, and even others, but especially Don uh, for, uh, for the website. I mean, it's, it's an amazing website. It's, it's just as good, if not better than the main IDA website. These are so many resources, so many links, so many programs, uh, so much information uh, that uh, it, it's like a game. You can, you can keep clicking and get lost in it in terms of what you can find over there. So strongly encourage you go click around, see what's going on, see what interests you see what resources uh, are available to you for, for using for whatever it is that you want to do and things like that. Another thing I would strongly recommend is an hour long movie, a documentary that uh, is freely available in high def uh, on YouTube uh, by this gentleman called Sriram Murli, um, uh, who has come, who's done this amazing documentary. I mean, it's, has beautiful pictures of beautiful people talking about light pollution and their love for astronomy and the environment and, 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 and animal plant health and those sorts of things. Uh, a lot of things that I kind of skipped over in terms of uh, why we should study light pollution, why we should do something about it are nicely covered in this documentary. It's, it's really beautiful. I strongly recommend it. It's only an hour long. You can have it on in the background as you're doing your daily chores or whatever. Um, it's really good. Uh, and then, uh, especially to the amateur astronomers here and even professional astronomers or professional scientists and, and, and members of the, and the public in general, anyone who's interested in astronomy at any level, anyone who's interested in the environment at any level, uh, should at least take a look at this Globe at Night program. It's a beautiful program. It's worldwide. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things I would like to do both in Kirksville with my students and the astronomy group that I lead. And also I would like uh, IDA Missouri to take over a little bit. And then groups like SLAS and, uh, uh, and, and the Kansas City Astronomy Group as well um, is to participate in, in Globe at Night. 
it basically involves either taking pictures, either taking sky quality meter readings, or just using your eye and looking at a few constellations. You also have an app that you can install on your phone, either Android or, or, uh, or iPhones. Uh, and you can use the app to upload your data, uh, which you can, like I said, either collect with the app itself or with a sky quality meter or with your eye. Um, and then uh, you can upload those data uh, for your location. So your phone, the app will take up your location uh, with GPS, time, location, et cetera. So you don't even have to input that if you're using the app. And then you can input your data over there. Uh, it's, it's very useful. I'm, I'm kind of ashamed to say I've never actually done it myself but it's one of the things I'm going to do in the next uh, next few days when the night is clear and when the moon is not up. Uh, so that's something, it's one of my goals for this summer is to start that process. And it's, it's like any other thing. Once you start, then it's not harder to continue. It's always the starting process that is time consuming because we're all busy. We have so many things to do. Okay, so that's kind of your homework, if you will. Uh, you know, browse through the Dark Sky Missouri website, check out the uh, Saving the Dark documentary and if you're really ambitious and if you really do feel like, oh, this is an exciting thing, I can add to whatever astronomy uh, activities you're doing, I can add to it, then Globe at Night is, is really a good one to go. Uh, I also want to leave you with a few questions. Uh, let's see, what do I have? Uh, yeah, that's it. This is the last slide. Uh, it's a, it's a, a few questions I want to leave you with in terms of activism. I haven't talked much about activism here uh, for the sake of time, uh, but... Um, you know, there, there are some questions that you have to ask yourself and say, okay, fine, all this is very interesting and everything, but are you moved enough to actually act? If you're moved to act, do you know some basic things that you need to know in order to take those actions? Um, do you know people who might be interested? Do you know who you need to go to talk to because they are creating too much light pollution than is warranted? Uh, do you know the local city authorities? Do you know someone, the city manager, the city planner, the uh, tourism person? Can you go talk to them? Is there a park nearby? Can you go talk to them? Uh, if you want to create awareness about it, do you know it's one thing to just stop, but it's one thing to talk and influence action. So it's one thing to say, oh, this is an interesting phenomenon. Yeah, look, uh, you know, the east, east part of the sky looks like polluted. The west part looks fine. That's all great. But what are you going to do about it? Uh, and then funding sources. Ultimately, it's about money, isn't it? Like, yeah, fine, all this is great. We should change, but where do you get the money? So I'll leave you with these questions and I'll, I'll stop here. Like Jim was suggesting, I can keep going till kingdom come, but I'll stop. And I know it's a little late. We started a little late and I probably ran over 15 minutes or so. Um, but um, I'll stop here. I'll be happy to hang around and, and entertain any questions. Uh, but I'll leave it to Jim to manage all that from here on. <laughs> okay, does anybody have any questions? Go ahead and stop sharing, sorry. By you. <laughs> yep. No questions, no questions. Are you, for you folks on case one, you can actually uh, put questions uh, in the uh, chat if too. I, if I might, um, I think rather than just going to city officials um, with requests for reduction of, with requests for reduction of light, um, as a city official, I have, I get more leverage for code changes if there are objective measurements available and solutions that can be codified in ordinances to support um, whatever initiatives are being proposed. How are you going, how are you uh, doing in standardizing your measurements and providing information, not just on pollution levels, but also on viable solutions that can be implemented by utility companies, by developers, and by, for instance, um, uh, uh, mall owners and shopping center owners. 
Yeah, uh, that's a very good question and a very good, uh, very good point actually. That it's one thing to just have data, but you know, again, how do you actually, um, how do you, what, what, what is it exactly that you want to take to the city officials so that they can act? Uh, so the idea itself has lots of uh, uh, guidelines on that. Um, there are um, example city ordinances. Many of them have been implemented out in the West because. They have lots of tourism dollars associated with light pollution or curbing light pollution. Um, so uh, there are example ordinances uh, that you can basically not quite cut and paste, but borrow lots of ideas from. Um, and there are IDA approved fixtures of various kinds, both outdoors for commercial purposes, as well as for households for their, you know, for their porch light or whatever. Um, and so they come with IDA approval. So there are, some of them are available at Home Depot and things like that. So, so in terms of taking, uh, so in terms of taking things in an official way to city managers or city officials, the IDA and Missouri IDA uh, come to us first because I, the I, the main organization, the International Dark Sky Association, will work with Missouri IDA, for example, and come up with these sorts of technicalities before we can take it to city officials because I, I couldn't see who asked the question but for the gentleman who, who, who mentioned uh, about what to take to city officials and all that is absolutely right uh, but there is a there is a step in between which will be filled by IDA and Missouri IDA okay so if you are living in a city where you have a group that is already discussing this or or you will do that eventually and you reach the point where you're well informed you have a sky quality meter or two uh, set up or your handle one so you can take readings. If you have reached that stage uh, that you have some data to show what's going on in your town, then come to us. Then we will go through those steps of saying, okay, uh, we, we know we have quantified the problem. Here are the possible tax to go towards a solution in terms of ordinances, in terms of out, what kinds of outdoor fixtures. Again, color of the light is very important. So what colors to be used or not to be used. Most LED lights uh, come with dimmers as well. So how bright to keep those lights, no matter what color they are, all those things we can work through depending on the locality, depending on what's possible and not for a given situation. We then take that package to the uh, to the city officials. So, so when I mentioned on the slide that go to, the, I didn't say go to the city officials. It was more a personal thing. Do you know the city officials? Have you established initial contact with them to give them a heads up that we are working on this and we'll come to you in the near future? But that gap between activism on an individual level to uh, to then going to the city officials and and kind of not demanding but at least uh, 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 lobbying for for change in lights, that gap will be filled up by experts at the IDA and, and Missouri IDA. I hope that answers the question, or at least addresses the point you were trying to raise. So we have a question from Indiana. Uh, okay. Wants to know if you're doing any research beyond Missouri? Uh, the more the merrier. Um, if, uh, I, I can't remember if Indiana has a dark sky, uh, international dark sky chapter. If not, it might be a good time to start. Uh, I'm sure Don and I and others at IDA Missouri will be more than happy to, uh, you know, to guide you through that process if needed um, and give you pointers, do's and don'ts. You know, you don't have to make the same mistakes, some of the mistakes we made probably, if any. Um, and so, um, so yeah, that would be a good point. Uh, but if you have already got a light uh, sky quality meter and you're collecting data and you want to share it with us, uh, we'll be happy to use it. It depends. Uh, send me an email and I, I can follow follow it up with you. Bayou, we got a question from Facebook. They're asking what app that you use for observations. I think like an iPhone or Android app. What what apps do you suggest? Uh, if you go to the Globe at Night website, the GAN website, they have a link to the apps. Um, they uh, it depends on what kind of phone you have and those sorts of things. So just look up globe at night, light pollution or something like that on Google and you'll get it. Uh, Bayou, can you put your email address in the chat? Sure. And also while you're in there, 
um, the three links to Globe at Night, Dark Sky Missouri, and the other YouTube video. Put the links for those in there too. And I'll okay. post those, what, those links on our website. Okay. Any other questions in chat or you can just unmute and ask it? Oh, so you, uh, Brad wants to know if you get if you can get him a uh, an SQM meter. You got good prices. Uh, if uh, you uh, Don might be a better person to answer this, but um, but yeah, I mean, if you go through us and you if you're participating in our program, uh, we can get you a discount. Yeah. And I know those for, those run about two hundred, right? Uh, it depends. Like I was showing earlier, it depends how many bells and whistles you're getting with it. So if you just get the handheld one, I think it's like $130. Uh, but if you get the uh, one that works on batteries, uh, it's about 250 And then if you get the weather casing, it's another, it's 300 And if you get the uh, solar powered batteries, then it's another $50 more, something like that. Yeah, okay. Any other questions, either in the chat or you can just um, unmute. Hold on, I'm still looking for the links. I can't seem to find them for some reason. <laughs> they, were, they were on your uh, PowerPoint. I know, I, I should have just Googled them. It's harder to find from the PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh, it was at the end, wasn't it? Yeah, it was at the third to last slide, I think. Yeah, I got it. Joe wants to know, are the meter readings affected by local sources, such as a house nearby? Uh, yes and no. So, so that's why you have to be careful about where you mount the. Uh, oh, I'm sending private messages here. Right? Yeah, you got to reply to everyone, right? <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, I was just sending it to John for some reason, and he, he kindly forwarded it to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was the other link? Here's the YouTube link. Right, the YouTube link, and then it was, uh, I think it was the Dark Skies Missouri link. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, it does depend on local. We try and, when we set up the light sensors everywhere, we said roof of the building is probably the best place, especially if it's two or three stories, because it's unlikely there's an overhead light source nearby. And then the opening angle of our sensor is about 20 degrees. So as long as there's nothing within 20 degrees, no like direct light source within 20 degrees, so much the better. But it doesn't like has a sharp cut off at 20. It still has some uh, give around 20 degrees. So the best thing is to just put it above the light line, so to speak. So on, roof, on the roof of your house or the roof of a building, make sure there are no overhanging trees because of course the trees are not sources of light, but they can reflect light back, right? If someone shines a light on a tree, a moving car or, or a nearby light. So you want to avoid having trees and, uh, you know, and overhead lights. So the roof of buildings. So most of our sensors are either out on the farm somewhere or out in an observatory. So there are no trees nearby or on roof of buildings within the city. So on top of city hall or on top of the science building or something. Like that. If you live out in the country, the, the really main concern is trees. You have to be away from trees or at least get on top of the trees somehow. Okay, I got one more request. You need to hold up the mug. You might have to turn off your virtual sky though. I don't know if your mug will show up there or not. Wait, what is that? Oh, this this last mug we sent you. We we need a quote unquote mug shot. <laughs> oh, the mug shot. Okay, yeah, it's in my it's in my office. I can go get it. <laughs> any other questions for anybody? Yeah, if there aren't any other questions, I'll go get it. Yes, uh, if you have more information would you like to present again next year oh sure we'll have much more because we are still analyzing all these data that are coming in uh, i don't know if any uh, uh, i know there are a couple of people from the sqm program the idea sqm program that were logged in uh and and it kind of depends on them how long they want to continue my next step really is to you know if the pandemic hadn't hit my students hadn't gone back home halfway into the semester we were planning on driving around to various parts and even the places where we have SQMs and doing those angle measurements. So that's something we'll be working on once things become a little more normal in the next few months. And then we'll just continue to get all these data. And then 
you know, I showed you that slide with, with a table with essentially most of the entries were blank. My hope is by the end of summer, we'll have all those filled up. We'll have all those uh, programs written, check, double check, triple check, make sure we got it everything right. And so we'll have much more data and hopefully more insights and more activism as well. So yeah, I'll be happy to come back next year uh, because I'm expecting lots of good things to happen. What would be the best month for you? And I will send you a list of dates. Yeah, just send me a list of dates and I'll, I'll probably pick something. Probably summer, late summer is probably best. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Sure. So we're going to give him a second to um, to go get his mug. And while sure. he does that, I'm going to share a screen here. and Yeah, share the so, screen. And then if, I, if any other questions trickle in, just let me know. I, I'm happy to answer Okay, them. we'll do. Uh, and so we're going to take a look at a, 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 a new website that I kind of discovered uh, not too recently or not too long ago. Uh, it's called Astrospheric. It's not atmospheric as in the sky, but astro. And this is pretty much the do-all, be-all, end-all for astronomers in terms of um, cloudy skies and sky presentations. Um, so you have a, a block that looks like clear sky clock data. Uh, you have another block that looks like NOAA data with graphical uh, work. Uh, if you scroll down, you can get an extended cloud forecast. You go to the bottom, you get moon phase data. Uh, it uses your current location so it knows exactly where you're at. Um, and it does that automatically. You say use current location. It, uh, it does that here and gives you your latitude and longitude, which by the way, if you're setting up your scope and you need to punch that in, that's an easy way to get that. Um, if you click on the map layers uh, and click for that, uh, you can show anything you want um, on your map. And so just here's a few quick ones. This is actually smoke. So there's fires out here apparently. Um, here's cloud cover for tonight. Um, and you can actually play and show these, uh, in, show these uh, uh, in the future, et cetera. Um, so you can, you can see what that looks like. Um, and this is true for all of them. Um, you can also get these wonderful measurements. Uh, this is transparency. So it gives you a nice graphical uh, uh, block for transparency. It gives you a graphical block for seeing conditions. Um, it gives you a graphical block for uh, ground temperature, um, a graphical block for infrared view, um, a graphical block for light pollution. Gee, where, that might, where might that be handy? Notice we have the Bartle scale, the Bartle scale here uh, showing the light pollution. And by the way, for any of these, you can zoom in um, as you wish to find uh, those areas. And I think uh, on some of these, it'll give you the actual data depending, depending on where you click. Um, and then uh, allow the location access, okay. Uh, so those are just those views on the map. You can do it with satellite uh, map as well. Um, so you can show the cloud cover over the satellite map. Um, on. So it's a, it's a pretty powerful program. Um, and again, this is um, um, av available uh, just at astrospheric.com. And you have, to, you have to make sure that you put in um, astro, not, not as at most. I've done that two or three times. So you can show terrain or satellite. Um, you can show, uh, make it dark if you want. It even shows things like aerosols, um, and it shows uh, things like the jet stream. Hopefully that'll pop up here. We go. There's, there's the jet stream reading. And you can set favorite locations if you like, um, you know, for your favorite observing locations. And there are also, um, there are also already, uh, see, if, see if I can find those. Sorry, it's getting in the way of my screen here. Hang on. Uh, there's, you can also set the uh, parameters for measurements and so on. Uh, there's a large FIQ section, um, et cetera. 
Um, and you can also, there's at least one location in here uh, where it shows where you are on the map. There we go. Um, so these dots, these blue dots, are locations that are already in. Rambleseek, for example, is already there. Um, I think if somebody correct me, but I think this is uh, where Powell Observatory is um, and so on. So there are a number of locations already map, put on the map. So I'm sure we could probably get Danville, Whiteside, you know, some other areas that might be useful um, positioned in there as well. Uh, there's our friends up at Jim Edgar Panther uh, State Park, et cetera. Um, and so if you're interested in trying to get all your data from one place, um, I think it's a I think it's a pretty cool site to check out. Any questions on any of that? Yeah, Jim, we got a question on ask on basically if there's a smartphone version of it, and I can tell you there is a yes, smartphone there, version of it. There, yeah, there there is um there are apps available for that. Uh, let's see. It's, well, yeah, it's actually it's, it's, it's actually the same thing except I've got one right now on the iPhone. So. Yeah, so uh, you can get it from the App Store or uh, Google Play, depending on your phone. Um, Etc. Um, and it gives you where the data is from and so on. Um, uh, et cetera. So, but yeah, you can, you can do this on an app on your phone as well. And it's got nice handy moon data as well. So that's kind of convenient. It doesn't have sunset or anything. But. And then we have a, we have a question here about when is the next quick presentation, which I'm not sure what quick presentation is, but. Uh... Uh, when is the next one like this, you mean? Well, it says next quick presentation. That's by Chris. Oh, no, that, that was um, wondering what this was going to be. <laughs> oh, I got you. Okay. okay. That, that question you got answered. Okay. Got okay. Um, uh, the next thing we have to, well, stick around because we're going to give away some prizes. I already have um, all the names from the participants uh, in a box here. So we should be good to go for that. Um, and let's see. You ready for your mug shot? Sure. Let me get set up for that. Hey, James. Yeah. There was one more question that was for um, for Dr. G. Yeah. Okay. It says that, we're the, sorry, any thoughts about uh, the correlating the SQM data and the clear sky um, clock data to add to the predictive tools for astronomers? That was a question that was asked by uh, M. Jones. Mark Jones. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Okay. Okay. Um, well, so um, the Globe at Night program has SQM set up at lots of different locations. And I haven't quite explored what they are doing with those data. Um, and the clear sky clock data is, is mostly satellite based as I understand it. Um, and so I'm not sure even if we have SQMs, like I said, SQM is measuring basically what's going on at one location. So it might be a little tricky to, for it to be useful for like, it, you know, general public. You know what I mean? Like if, if, if I put in an SQM reading for Kirksville, it's not gonna be very useful for even someone who is 50 miles away from me. So it's useful to me, but it's not useful to anyone else. So. So, so yes and no, I, I mean, Clear Sky, they have a link for light pollution in general. You can go to the Clear Sky website and click on light pollution and it throws up a map, which is a little dated now. It's before the Weir's map. Uh, so you have like that genetic information and I don't think day-to-day -day changes are that relevant for the general public unless they happen to live right next to, you know, within five or 10 miles of where the SQM is. Uh, did you look at the map that's on the astrospheric? Yeah, yeah the it's a, the clear sky map, the clear sky map, as I understand, is similar. The atmosphere looks more fancy, but. Yeah, the astrospheric is, uh, they have listed who the data is from. Uh, yeah. So uh, we'll get yeah. that. Well, let's get the mug shot because we still got a couple more things to do. Okay, should I get rid of the background? Uh, no, not, not absolutely. Not. I'm going to get all get it all here. So, this is so. Is this gotta, good? Got to look straight forward. So smile. And there you go. Click. We got you. You've you been me before. I could have tried to get my wife to cut my hair. Oh, no, 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 no. That's fine. <laughs> we know. We know what's going on. <laughs> it, it's not a problem for anybody. It's been months since I got a haircut. 
<laughs> now, in other, before we give away the prizes, in other, um, in other, in another aspect here, uh, let me share the screen again. Hang on. Do, 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 do. Sorry, I got to get to the page first. So on our website, we put a couple links that you may be interested in. Um, um, Abby Ballenbeck, who spoke to us back in October, uh, is the host for a new series hosted by Astronomy Magazine called Infinity and Beyond and Beyond. There are two videos, one introducing Abby, and the other is the first episode for the series. Um, so here's just a, a quick hit on the, the, the uh, video for that. Hi, I'm Dave Iker, editor of Astronomy Magazine, and I'm excited to tell you that we have a new video series starring the one and only Abigail Bolenbach. Uh, she is an incredible science communicator, very accomplished uh, young lady, and we're going to get to know her, meet her, and get to know her today a little bit. Abby, it's good to have you in the fold. How are you doing today? So um, if you want to check that out, the links are on the website. Um, so we had the pleasure of having her here for a speaker. Uh, it was rather terrific. Uh, but this is a new series, um, a new series as it's been started. So um, should be should be really cool, I think. So uh, look forward to watching those. Um, I've watched both of them. They're great. Nice interview from Dave Iker. So um, if you get a chance, um, then take a look at those. Um, let's see. Should we give away some prizes? <laughs> oh, and Rick Menendez is the one that pointed it out to me. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Appreciate that. I do a lot of searching. I still haven't found her Facebook page. Um, but if you happen to know that, you can forward that to me if you want. But I think the videos posted here are pretty good. So, um, all right. So let's give away some prizes here. What are we giving away first, Brad? All right. Let's see. You have a choice between a subscription to a Stardate magazine, a $25 gift certificate for an, that goes toward the purchase of an astronomy magazine of your choice. The only catch is you can't bother Bill to order it. You have to, do the, you have to order it. A $45 gift certificate to a fabulous co company called Looking Up. And we have DVDs. On a blue book, and of course, are always available. Fellow Chinese lasers. <laughs> no idea what he said. But. Yeah, semi-legal. Yeah, that means as long as you don't put batteries in it, they're legal. Okay, and the first name is, as we're drawing out here, Alan Sapia. Your choice, buddy. What do you want? Just post it in the chat. Or you can just tell, you can just unmute and tell us. Alan, you is still he, with us? Is he still there? Let me check. Do, 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 do. Do, do. Oops, I don't see Yes, him. he's still yeah, here. He is? He is? Okay, good. Is he, is he awake? <laughs> His mic is not on. Yeah. Hey, Alan, are you here? I think we lost Alan. Oh, well, he'll get the next choice. Um, meanwhile, while we wait, Don Ficken. Yeah, he's actually he's actually uh, unmuted himself, so I can see that he can talk now. No, I, I unmuted him. And so, Don Ficken, you're a winner. Take a pick, man. What are my choices again? I'm sorry. <laughs> Put him hey, in the chat, Brad. Starting magazine, a $25 gift certificate to an astronomy magazine of your choice, but you have to order it. A $45 gift certificate to a fabulous company called Looking Up. And, and DVDs, a season one, a Project Blue Book. Project Blue Book. Well, I'll help. It's the UFO program. I'll help my friend out looking up there. I'll take that one, I guess. Looking up, all right. Yeah, I actually have his number, so. <laughs> and our next winner is Wayne Clark. Oh, my gosh. Tell us what you want, Wayne.
Wayne, are you with us? Are these people falling asleep? We need to put them on cam. <laughs> Wayne's still here. I see him there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's unmuted himself. Oh, there he is. Hang on. Everybody, everybody hush. He's, he's talking. Go ahead, Wayne. Um, I guess I'll take the uh, $45 certificate. Oh, they're looking up? Okay. Don's already taken that. Oh, I'm happy to let him have that. I, I'll take something else. It doesn't make any difference. Well, it doesn't matter. I, I don't know who what that organization is. Or oh, Randy, raise your hand. It's looking up optics. Put a link in the in the um, chat there, Randy. <laughs> we didn't hear that because you're muted, but that's all right. Hey, Don, what do you think? Just whatever's fine. I don't care. Well, yeah. you got to pick one. <laughs> well, if that's already spoken for the uh, optics, I'll, I'll uh, go for the astronomy magazine coupon. Okay, the next winner is Jeff Carpenter. Jeff, you Your choices there? are? I'll take the Project Blue Book. There you go. Rats. I was gonna... <laughs> and the next prize goes to Dan Duffy. And are you still here? The only thing available are two lasers and a Stardate magazine. I think Dan left. Did he? Yeah, yeah he's, he's not on there. I don't see him now. Dan's gone. Got to be present to win. We'll try again. Mary Bartow. Yeah, Dan left. Is Mary still here? Somebody check and see if she's still here. She I don't think here? she's here anymore. Okay. And the next one is oh, Rick Menendez. Still here, Rick? He's showing us here, but I don't see anybody on this picture. Oh, there he is. I just I just unmuted him. Rick, you can talk. Yeah, I was in the other room, so sorry. Move the screen remotely in my other room. What do I get? What are the prices? What are, what are the prices? A twenty-five dollar gift certificate to pay attention. <laughs> sorry, I'm doing my work. I've got some I'm teaching online. It's a it's a nightmare. I'm working night and day. Uh, you have a twenty five. Uh, you have a gift certificate for Stardate magazine or a Chinese laser. I'll take another laser. Will do. You never have too many lasers. Right. I'm teaching observational again this fall. Uh, do you should you mail it to me or how do I do? How do I get it? Uh, I'll walk. Uh, you have to walk to come up here. <laughs> I don't have a car right now. My car's been in a shop for a week. Can't get the fan to work. Well, start walking. Yeah, start now. You'll get there by Monday. He shows up at work Monday. All right. How many prizes have we got left, Brad? One laser, Star Date Magazine. Okay. And this one, oh, Thane, you're a winner. Well, Thane's iPad is a winner. <laughs> Uh, Star Date Magazine. All right. Still there. So the last one here is for a Chinese laser. Oh, I have one. Goes to, uh, that goes to Don. John Strebeck. You still here, John? Yeah, there he is. Yes, I sure am. Okay. Can't wait for sound. Laser sounds great. Thanks. Yep. Should be good. Anything else, Brad? Yes. Do you have to wait till September to get more prizes? Okay. 
any other announcements? So, Mark, you want to talk about the the, the um, awards, sir, or the award system, special awards? You or Larry, either one. Mark still here. Hey, Jim. Yo. Um, if I may, um, our next month presenter is a returnee, Dr. Emily Kimball from NARO in New Mexico. And it will be about radio quasars and the VLA. She will send a more up-to-date um, topic and bio later on this month. Okay. All right, I need to go. It was great. Okay. Thank, thank you, Professor. Professor. All right. Appreciate bye. it. Bye. Thank you, Doctor. Good night. Yeah. Thank Everybody you. Everybody wave goodbye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>
at a, uh, uh, a primary school or uh, college level that have supported uh, SLAS missions in providing talks and, and support to SLAS and to the, to the St. Louis area. So this is a, um, if you have any nominations for any faculty and educators in the area, please, uh, please fill this out. Please fill out the nomination form and, uh, and send it back in. This, uh, this one here on the Robert E. Cox Park Economy Award is, is also another one where the member or the nominee does not have to be a SLAS member, but we, we want the person to be more of a local resource than an international resource. So, um, you know, rather than nominating a, a David Levy or a Neil deGrasse Tyson, this would be for uh, somebody at our regional, local and regional level who, uh, who exemplifies uh, astronomy, popularizing of astronomy. The uh, Alfred Woods Mentoring Award uh, is primarily focusing on uh, amateurs, helping amateurs and being mentors to, to amateurs, either in terms of telescope making or any aspects related to astronomy. And this would be for a, uh, for a, for a SLAS member. Uh, the outreach, uh, we have several other outreach awards, but Lois Fitter certainly uh, was one of our best when it comes to uh, her outreach activities. And this, is, this would be in recognition to, to a SLAS member for their outreach contributions. And then last but not least, the Albert Obrecht Founders Award. Albert was one of the founders of the Astronomy Club back in 1936 and served, I think, as his first president. Uh, th this would be primarily for, uh, this would be for a SLAS member and it would be for uh, someone that would be holding a, that has held or in the past or currently holds a position as an officer or committee member, because I think we all realize how much time and effort, volunteer time and effort it takes to, to run an organization and to contribute to its, uh, its growth and stability. And so recognition of those types of people is very important. So hopefully with, uh, with the implementation now of this uh, new awards program that uh, you'll be able to uh, submit your nominations. Uh, nominations, you can nominate any person for more than uh, more than one category. And of course, a person can be nom uh, uh, more than one person can be nominated for uh, um, for the same award. So um, all of these will be filtered through the recognition committee final selection. And then the, uh, the nomination forms will be kept on file uh, for at least two years so that those persons will be certainly considered uh, for, for future recognition. Any questions? Oh, one more thing I guess I should say, and that is that uh, we had planned to kick this off earlier in the year and we just, with everything going on, uh, we didn't get it kicked off as soon as we wanted to. Um, we've extended nominations till uh, July 1st. I think we're gonna have to give some grace period on that as well. The, com the review committee uh, was scheduled to meet by August 1st to, to make their selection. But I think we're gonna have to alter that somewhat considering it's now June 19th. Uh, that we, we need to get give a little bit more grace period to folks to, to submit their nominations. So um, my recommendation would be that the deadline be August 1st for, uh, for this year, and then we'll fall back into a, a more consistent cadence of a May 1st uh, nomination deadline 
that will coincide with our um, our annual meetings, our excuse me, our, our annual elections and things like that, and then we'll uh, we'll have a more regular cadence of May first for the deadline. But for this year, uh, website says July first. Um, please try to get them in by July first. If you need more time, uh, please let the awards committee know that you have intentions of completing it, but we have to set a, a deadline date because um, the awards committee needs to meet and, and finalize the selections. All right, any questions? Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, one other announcement I'd like to make is that we, we still plan to have uh, our sky orienteering uh, for this Sunday evening. And uh, it's, it's a members only sky orienteering. It'll be the first one we've had since the, uh, since the COVID uh, pandemic, but the crowds have always been small in the past of three to three to six people or three to 10 people. And, and so we can maintain good social distance and, and still safely enjoy the night sky. So the plan would be to, uh, to meet uh, Sunday evening and we'll go through our, our normal sky orienting process where we pick out some constellations, we go through uh, how to find those constellations, how to find certain objects uh, in those constellations, how to improve your skills on star map reading and navigating your way around the night sky. So our, our next event is this Sunday evening and you can check our um, the night sky network, our, our slash calendar page uh, for the, the exact time and the location and uh, please RSVP so that we know you're coming. All right, thanks. All right, any other announcements or anything uh, people like to bring up before we close it out? And the silence is deafening. <laughs> oh, no, I have one, I have one. Oh, of course. If anybody has any topics that they wanna hear Email me with suggestions and if you have a contact person. That's all I needed. All right, Brad. That's it. Anybody else? All righty. Well, that's that's it for tonight. If you want to stick around and chat, you're welcome to do that. Um, Thank I'll, you, Jim. I'll leave the meeting open for a little bit. If you want to hang out for social hour, go get something to drink and come back if you like.